Thanks very Have much. Fun. Okay. So I have to wear this really weird like thing for the people that are recording. So yeah, um, my name is John Britton. I work at GitHub. Uh, and this talk is uh, about how we work. So uh, kind of the structure of the company, our work style, and how we decide what to work on and you know what we build. Um, my name is John Britton. If you look on the internet and you want to find me, I look like that. Everywhere it's an eight-year-old picture. Uh, I haven't updated it. Um, I'm in Berlin right now. I've been here for a few months. Uh, this is what 2013 looks like for me. Uh, each color is a different place. So uh, I don't have a permanent home. I spend my time traveling. Uh, every couple of months I, I find a new place, or more frequently than that, uh, in some cases. Um, at GitHub I work on education, so that's why I'm here at uh, Technical University of Berlin. Uh, I spend my time working with teachers, students, student groups, uh, robotics teams, all kinds of uh, academic uh, types of uh, organizations and how they use Git and GitHub. Uh, I spend a lot of my time teaching. Um, you know, teaching people how to use version control, why it's important, proper software development practices. Uh, but today, uh, I'm going to talk about the kind of how GitHub works uh, internally and less about technical stuff. So to get started, I want you to think about, uh, you know, when you're looking at a company, either starting your own or uh, thinking about starting to work at a company, you know, what defines uh, their culture? You know, what, what do you think of? And a lot of places would have you, you know, uh, the first thing pop into your head when you think about their culture is like fun and awesome stuff. Like, oh, I want to work here because this, this, and this, right? So like, you know, free food, unlimited vacation, toys and games in the office, and none of that stuff is culture. Um, that's, that's kind of like, you know, just kind of a sham. Um, they're perks, they're really fun, they're easy to talk about, and they're used as a tool to hire people, to get people to stay, but they don't define your culture. Um, Okay, your culture is expressed as like your internal values. So what, what do you, why do you do these things, right? Um, so at GitHub, you might have heard, you know, we can work anywhere. This sounds really awesome. Uh, we don't have meetings and we don't have managers, but that's not our culture. These are just symptoms. And we had a talk internally. Every week we do these, uh, they're called Beer 30 talks, where the CEO or, you know, one of the original, uh, one of the founders of GitHub will get up at the front of the room and, you know, give a talk about, uh, philosophy of the company and things like that. And one of the topics was that, you know, we find a lot of people talking about symptoms of culture, but not about the actual, uh, you know, reasons behind them, the, the values that we have. So he gave this talk internally, and it, uh, it really struck a, you know, a chord for me. So, you know, these symptoms of culture, they don't have any real meaning, and people frequently copy them. So you might say, for example, oh, Google, they have, uh, free food and 20% time and all this cool stuff. And then a new company starts up and they just copy all those things directly and say, we're going to do the same thing as Google. But they don't have the, you know, the meaning behind them. They're just kind of copying these perks. Um, that doesn't really work uh, because you know, each individual organization, each group of people kind of has their own kind of values. And if you just try to put those on top of other people, they don't, it doesn't really work very well. So think about, think about values when you're talking about the culture, um, the culture of your company. So why does GitHub work the way that we do? Why do we you know, have a distributed team? Why do we work asynchronously? And you know, you know, what, are, what are the things that, uh, that cause this? We, have, we, we approach most of our problems from what we call first principles. Like what are the, the driving forces behind you know, deciding how we should do something? So for example, if you take a feature um, let me think of a, a recently released feature on GitHub, um, like online editing, right? So you can go to GitHub, you can browse to repository, you can make a new branch, you can edit it, you can um, you know, edit files, add files, delete files, make commits, but why did we do that and why did we choose to do it the way that we did? Well, you know, the overarching vision for GitHub is to make it easier to work together than to work alone. So. Uh, we kind of came at it from that angle of, you know, what would make it easier to work together than alone? Well, if, I'm on, if I work on a team of programmers and we have a product manager or uh, a QA person or somebody who has no idea how Git works, how do we make it easier for them to get into our process? Well, if they can just go to the website and edit things right on the page, then that's super easy for them. So that's, that's kind of the idea of first principles, you know, attack a problem from uh, the root, like the definition uh, of it. So, in this, in this Beer 30 talk that I was mentioning before, um, 
Tom kind of outlined these, these first principles uh, you know, of our culture. Like, what, what does it mean, and why do we do the things we do? Well, you know, here's a big list, and I'm going to go through them you know, one by one and kind of give a little bit of an idea of what each is. So security. At the, at the bare minimum, to have a happy team, to have uh, people who are working together like, very well, everybody has to be secure. You know, they have to feel like they can trust each other. They have to feel like you know, they're not competing for rank and things like that. Um, they have to be you know, safe and healthy, and you know, they need to be able to like, support their families. So you know, one, of the reasons, you know, the, one of the main reasons why people work is you know, they need to make money, and they want to take care of their families. So uh, at, at like the base level, uh, there's security. So we have you know, make sure people are paid you know, very well or properly uh, compensated for their time. They can trust each other, um, and you know, that's, that's the idea of security. The next principle is freedom. So freedom isn't just about you know, having no rules. It's about having, you know, having the, opportunity, the, the ability to make the best decisions that you can. So you, for example, might be the, the most well-versed on a particular topic, a particular library, a particular technology. And uh, I don't know what the, the amount of like, in-the-field experience is here, is here, but it's very often that you're assigned a problem in a job as a developer and kind of given a solution from your manager, and they say, here's how you're going to solve this problem. Go solve it, right? Like, we're going to pay you. Go, go off and code this thing up, and here's the spec. Um, at GitHub, we make sure people are free to kind of make their own decisions. Uh, the person who's most well-suited for making the decision should make it. Uh, there's no kind of hierarchy in the company. There's nobody. Like, I don't report to anybody. I don't have uh, someone telling me what I should do if I should come to you know, TU Berlin or if I should go to some other school. I just kind of choose that stuff for myself because that's, uh, that's the freedom uh, that we have. Also, it, it comes to a point of like managing your own time. So a lot of traditional companies will have like a nine to five work day. You go into the office, you sit behind a desk, you do your stuff, and it's expected that you're there Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, at GitHub, we kind of arrange it a little bit differently so that it's more of a, uh, you know, you should get enough of your work done, right? It's not, there's nobody telling you how much is enough or when you should do it. Um, and because we have so many people all over the world, um, it's, you know, it doesn't make sense to say 9 to 5, because what's that, 9 to 5 San Francisco time? That would mean I should be going to the office like right now. Um, so we have like kind of the freedom to organize our own time, kind of make our own decisions, um, and to also kind of drive a certain part of the company forward in the direction that we see, uh, see fit. So for education, again, like I spend my time kind of thinking about where we should be going. Should we be, you know, should we be teaching people how to code? Should we do things online? Um, there's all things like that. Um, the next is opportunity. And this is, a, you know, this is a big one inside of GitHub. We have this kind of um, structure where you're not assigned a problem, but you are hired into a problem. So when we hire people at GitHub, it's like, you know, John might be working. This is actually a case right now. I'm working on education. I've been at GitHub for about a year, and I'm really overwhelmed with stuff, and I would like to have somebody who has development skills to help me out to build some tools for teachers and, uh, and students. So I just wrote up a job description, and I said, I would like to hire a developer to do this job. Uh, a few people on my team reviewed it, maybe gave me some pointers, and then we, uh, it just automatically became an open position. Uh, somebody within the... You know, the founding team looked it over, said, okay, we're going to hire this position, and now I'm the person who decides who we're going to hire in that position and, you know, uh, when we should do it and, you know, how to bring them on. Uh, that's not to say that I'm the only one involved. It's just that, you know, within a certain area, you have your own ability to kind of organize those things. Um, and there are, there are other companies that do stuff like this. Uh, if you've ever heard of Valve or Gore, uh, Gore-Tec, I think it's, I think it's Gore-Tec, or maybe the company's just called Gore. Um, but the idea of this thing, uh, open allocation. So I created, I found this problem, and then I hire, I might hire into this problem. But once the person gets there and starts working on the problem, there's no, uh, there's no manager to say you have to keep working on this problem all the time. They might find that their skill set is better, is more useful in a different part of the company, and they have the opportunity to just go and do that. Uh, you know, they should be responsible and make sure that they're fulfilling their obligations. Maybe they help find a new replacement for their team before they leave. But anybody can go from team to team as they choose. Uh, cooperation. So this is like the big, uh, the big one for GitHub as a as a product. Like, what do we what do we exist for? We exist to make it easier for people to cooperate. Um, so essentially, this is so that anybody can um, kind of work on uh, work on problems in a 
in a way that's not like predetermined. So for example, uh, if I l work in Berlin and you know somebody else on the team works in uh, New York and somebody else works in San Francisco, how can we make sure that those people can, can cooperate without any, uh, you know, any overhead or very little overhead? And I'll, I'll show you kind of how we overcome some of those problems in a minute. Um, fun. This is like totally obvious. It's like, you know, don't, don't be too serious about things. How, like, a lot of companies will say stuff like this, but like, what does it actually mean? And in our case, it's kind of like, if you can make something fun or if you can do something in a fun way, everybody is a lot happier and you can kind of, um, just you know, enjoy yourselves a little bit more. So leadership is a is a is an important thing at GitHub, and I say leadership instead of management or um, you know, there's there's not a there's not like a set person who is the leader um, in a given team, right? Uh, that's like dictated to be the leader. It's more of um, a situation where you have kind of self-selecting leaders. Uh, in my case, I'm the only person who's working on education. But uh, so that would like kind of naturally make me a leader in, in my small area. But in like the larger teams like GitHub.com, people who are very well versed in a specific technology. So for, say for example, someone who's good with queuing or good with um, you know backend stuff will kind of naturally emerge as like the API person or the background jobs person, and they uh, they're the ones who will go and say you know we need help on this team. Let's go and make more uh, more positions, hire more people. Um, and kind of decide on the future of those uh, of those features. So, leadership isn't uh, you know isn't just a uh, like a commanded down thing. It's actually just from the bottom up. People kind of uh, become become leaders within their teams. Um, and it would be impossible to get anything done uh, without having some sort of commitment. So people um, people who are working on projects, you know, we. We can work on whatever we want, whenever we want, but if you start working on a project and uh, you, know, you get halfway through it and then you start working on another project and you get halfway through it and you start working on another project and you get halfway through it, it's kind of useless. You don't get anything done. Um, so we have a, a pretty strong uh, opinion towards like committing to something, usually committing to one thing at a time, doing it really well, and then finishing it, and then moving on to the next thing, whatever it is. So. Um, we take commitment pretty seriously in that people who, um, who start new projects should commit to them and make sure that they get shipped, you make sure they get finished. So that's a whole lot of words to talk about like the values, but let's, let's actually apply them for a second. Um, let's take a look at how the company uh, kind of exists and operates within those values. So I've said that GitHub is distributed. And this screenshot is out of date, but this is from an internal tool that we have called Team. Uh, and Team is one of the most awesome uh, applications ever. Uh, it basically keeps track of um, where people are that want to be. So you, you, don't have to, you don't have to post your location, but most everybody does. Uh, and what Team does is you can actually, uh, kind of like an internal Twitter, you can post status updates uh, and a lot of other features. But um, you know, this is where everybody is as of February. I haven't updated the screenshots. There was 161 people in 75 cities uh, at any one at this one given time. Um, so the company is totally distributed geographically. Um, there's no. Uh, if you want to hire the best people, you can't. You can't have uh, a specific location and the best people. You can have the best people in Berlin at your company, but you can't have the best people in the world in Berlin because not everybody's going to move to Berlin or to San Francisco in our case. So that's why we're geographically distributed. Um, so people live, at their, live wherever they want. They stay, you know, if they get a job at GitHub, they stay there. Some people do decide to move to San Francisco, but it's not a, not a requirement. Um, but if we're distributed like this, like how do we get to know each other and things like that? Well, twice a year we have this thing called GitHub Summit where everybody in the company flies out to San Francisco and you know, you might think it's like a, a big get work done type of thing, but it's actually the opposite. It's a big hangout. Like we just eat and drink and have a good time and do uh, kind of community building type activities, like hanging out, giving tech talks. Actually, that's one of the biggest things that we do is people from uh, different parts of the company will give tech talks about their kind of areas so everybody has an idea of what's going on. Um, and another thing that we do is called GitHub Destinations. And this one kind of happened out of nowhere. It uh, just, um, you know, was an idea someone had. Uh, hey, let's all go on a trip together to Berlin. Actually, it, it happened in Berlin last year. Uh, somebody said, hey, let's go to Berlin together and hang out. 
So a couple people found an Airbnb, they booked a, booked a house and started talking about it and more and more people started signing up and then all of a sudden it was like a company thing where the company is going to rent us this house and a whole bunch of people are gonna fly there and then we're gonna hang out for a month and work from you know, where we are uh, and get to know each other really well. Um, and living with people, you get to know them a lot better than you do hanging out with them for a week uh, in the office. Uh, I went to GitHub Destination Uruguay in, uh, in February. Um, and it was in a small town called Punta del Este, just outside of Montevideo. And one of our guys is from, uh, from uh, Montevideo. So he organized the house. He invited everybody out. We were just on the beach. Uh, I was there for two weeks. It was a, a month-long destination. And basically every weekend we did like a, an excursion. We rented a car. We drove out into the mountain or out into the countryside and, you know, did different stuff. We rented a boat for one day and kind of hung out in the ocean, saw seals, went to the islands. It was pretty cool. Um, and to make a GitHub destination happen, all you have to do is go to this app. Uh, so this is actually a screenshot from the app. You go to this app, Destinations, and you create a new destination. You drop a picture in. You say, these are the dates we're going, and then uh, people sign up. And if you get a kind of critical mass of people, then it happens. And that's, that's kind of how it, how it works. Um, I mentioned before about Summit. This is just kind of a, an idea of what the whole company looks like in one place. Uh, summits are super fun. Uh, like I said, there's not a lot of work getting done there. Um, but it is a chance to get to know each other. So that's how, that's how GitHub works as a, as a distributed company. Um, so I talked a lot about location, but we're also distributed in terms of uh, decision making and uh, kind of management like I talked about with uh, hiring. So each team is responsible for posting their own job descriptions, for coordinating their own interviews, and then eventually hiring people. Uh, each team is responsible for their own decisions on features and things like that as well. Um, so asynchronicity, this is, a, this is one, uh, github.com, the website, is like a perfect example of asynchronous uh, collaboration. So we do everything on the website. And so we write code, so this is some, some commits I made, and then this guy, John, who was in San Francisco, I think I was in uh, Finland when I did these commits, and he was in San Francisco, and then he comes in, you know, I did the commits, and then I wait, and a couple hours later, or a day later, I get a, a notification from him. Uh, saying, you know, you should fix these things, and then I fix them, and then I ship the, the code. And it's really important that I can do my work, and the people who I need help from get notified of it, and then they kind of respond. And, you know, in some cases, you, people ask me, like, oh, isn't it a really long lag? Well, actually, since there are people all over the world, I get responses in, like, minutes to hours as opposed to, you know, waiting until the next day when the sun rises in San Francisco. Like, there are people on both sides of me, uh, you know, around the, around the world in different time zones. Um, so, yeah, so this is, this is just code. But um, also we have this, we have chat internally. And if you, um, if you go into chat and you start talking, you know, this is like close, the closest to real time that we do. Uh, if two people happen to be in the chat room, if you're online, we generally idle in chat. Uh, if you happen to be in the chat room, you can talk to each other. But chat is also asynchronous. If somebody says my name, uh, I get a ping. That goes to team, and then team sends me a push notification on my phone, and now it's in a log. There's also a web, uh, a web view for my phone and a web view for uh, the chat client where I can go to um, you know, look at all of these mentions. People have mentioned me, and you can see each one of these happen like a couple hours apart or whatever, and I can go and make sure that I follow up with the people who need my attention on things. Um, so even our kind of closest to real-time interactions also have asynchronicity built into them. Uh, and this is awesome for being able to you know, collaborate across time zones and things like that. Uh, again, this is an out-of-date screenshot, but my, my week this week looks about the same. Um, I have no meetings at all uh, on my schedule. I went to the Git Meet, Git, Git meet Up Berlin for fun. But uh, yeah, we don't, we don't do uh, not even a weekly meeting. I told you we have this like weekly uh, beer 30 thing, and I'll get into it in, in a second of how that works, but um, we don't have any, you know, one-on-ones with our managers. We don't have anything like that, so it's totally asynchronous. You work when you want, uh, but it is like a, a huge responsibility to make sure that you follow up with people who need your help. Uh, you know, even though it's not immediate, you should be timely, you know, within a day or two. Make sure you, you do the things you need to. So I told you about this, uh, this beer 30 uh, thing. Every week, Usually Tom, the CEO, gets up and talks about some philosophy or something like that. Uh, and we have an internal app that, uh, just like you guys are doing, you're recording me on here, he gives the talks. And if you're in San Francisco and you want to sit there and drink beer and have, a, you know, have some cheese or some sausage or whatever uh, and listen to the talk, you can. 
Uh, you can also live stream it, um, or you can go back to the archive and uh, view the recording. So everybody watches these you know, once a week, but on your own schedule, so it's asynchronous. I generally watch mine on like Monday mornings uh, when I start the next week. Um, so yeah, this is a, a, the really cool part. I want to show you more about the, the team app I was talking about. So Git, GitHub is self-directed. We kind of decide what we work on. It's open allocation. Um, you know, it's not, you know, there's nobody telling me you have to build this thing. There are internal discussions that are like, wow, wow we really should build X, right? But if nobody's passionate about X, it doesn't get built. So um, the, we, either it doesn't get built or we hire somebody that's passionate about it. That's like the really common theme is, oh, we should really build this, but everybody else is like working on things they like and they don't want to change. So we hire somebody and then they work on that thing. Um, so here's my profile in team. You can see my name, my contact info. You can like download it as a, as a I don't know what they call that thing, a, a V card, right? Um, you can see my, all my contact info. You can see that I'm focused on education. Uh, and then there's this green button here that says John uh, and the Vision Network. Um, and the Vision Network's pretty cool. Um, this kind of shows you know, how I intersect with GitHub. So this is an, you can see on the top, there's some buttons. So you've got navigation, that takes you to the rest of the team. And then uh, home is like, uh, that takes me to me, that's where I am now. Um, this like arrow pointing at a thing is like an inward view. So the node that's selected is John, and we're looking at an inward view of John, so things that are just uh, connected. And then uh, you can like turn people on and off and you know, show just um, kind of the areas of the company that you're connected to, but also the people. So you can see that I'm kind of split between three, uh, three main categories, education, training and outreach. Outreach is kind of an overarching, like we talk to the world, we tell people about GitHub. You can see like the mission is up there. Training is a, a group that I'm like mostly, uh, most closely affiliated with. They do like paid gigs, they go to companies and they teach Git and GitHub. Um, and then education, which is in schools and things like that. And if you, uh, you know, change the focus of this to education, you can see how it's connected to the rest of GitHub. So you can see John is there and there's a dark arrow pointing, uh, it's kind of hard to see on the screenshot, but a dark arrow pointing for me. That shows that I'm like the primary res primarily responsible person for that, uh, that area of the company. Uh, there can be many, so if you look at GitHub, you can see there's three people with dark arrows. Like there are many people who are uh, like core focused on that. Um, and you can see that you know, education kind of intersects with these other parts of the company. Um, so that's, I can go in there and I'll, I'll bring it back to this interface. Um, there's a button on the top right that says modify the network. You can kind of align yourself, unalign yourself, add your skills. I don't have a sh screenshot of the skills thing, but uh, like developer, designer, um, community support. There's like different skills you can give yourself and you can kind of explore like, hey, I need somebody with these skills. Who do I ask for help? Uh, when it's 180 people, it's kind of hard to know everyone. Um, but what's really cool is if you have an idea for changing the structure of the company, we have a repository that has a kind of a, a textual representation of this graph, and you can fork it, you can make edits and submit a pull request, and people do it all the time uh, to, or not all the time, but they do it fairly frequently um, to suggest new things that we should focus on, new areas where we should hire, uh, and things like that. So this is another part of team. I said back before there's that navigation area. So you can go down here, and this is, uh, this is called ideas. Um, if you have an idea about you know, what we should be focused on that we're not already doing, you just uh, you know, write it up in here, and you'll get tons of feedback and comments, and it will eventually become something real if it has legs. So uh, I said GitHub destinations. I think somebody posted an idea, said, hey, let's go for you know, techno summer in Berlin. And they posted it up here, and it eventually turned into this destinations thing, which has its own app and you know, a whole process for getting things uh, to happen. So yeah, in, uh, so in summary, uh, don't try and copy culture. Think about your values. Think about why you want to do things the way you do, uh, because that defines, uh, that defines your culture. Uh, thanks. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think one tough decision I can use as an example that was that came up recently was, you know, should we hire someone or not, right? And because there's not a uh, a specific uh, like hiring, you know, one person like there's not an HR person who's like, yes, you're hired, no, you're not, right? It's each team is kind of individually uh, involved. Um, we had some, we had a few occasions where there were people that were pretty well qualified for the jobs they were applying for and you know one person out of the company was you know like maybe they had 10 or 15 people or maybe 10 people saying yes let's hire them and one person was like no i i think it's not a good idea um and in that case what do you do well in the when the company was much smaller it used to be you know one one thumbs down is like totally vetoed um but now what we've done is kind of made it so that every every hiring position has a a person who is you know is the hiring person like making the final decision and it's their job to get feedback from all of the interested parties and make the final decision in that case it's you know it's it comes down to what that person's best judgment is and we assume I think that the thing that's really important is that we assume no malice so when somebody sends you an email and you know it could potentially come off as like a little bit rude like assume no malice and just like talk to them and say hey what's up you know what do I need um, and that generally um, helps out uh, on the case of like, you know, we need to make money or we need to do this or that, um, it's, um, it's hard, but I think that, um, you know, in our case, we're, we're pretty lucky to have a very good product that makes a lot of money. Uh, so, you know, things that don't make money aren't, we don't, we don't have to do everything for money, right? Like, I mean, we do keep in mind, like, we're, we have a mission, like a goal to make it easy to work better, uh, to work together make it easier to work together than to work alone. But if, uh, you know, if one potential product, like say something we're working on, it's not currently available yet, it's not making any money, it's not uh, the end of the world. So I, I think that one's not, a, not as bad. But if you have a specific like, situation, maybe I could answer a little bit better. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think that um, so GitHub's grown a lot in the last year. Um, we're 180 now, and when I started, it was like 110. Um, so 70 people in less than a year. And then before me, like the six months before I started, the company was like half the size of what it was. So uh, it's grown a lot in the last couple of years. But um, in the early days, from what I understand, it was very, very lean. It was just, you know, these are the things we're doing, these are the people we have, and like they didn't hire that much. Um, so it was all, and it was also all bootstrapped. So, you know, if we weren't making money, we couldn't do anything. And the whole company, I've, I've heard it said a few times that the whole company is like a grand experiment for how people could potentially work together better. So uh, just as much as it's important for us to make money, it's also important, important for us to create an opportunity for people to have a really awesome job, like when they're working, to really like it, to feel like they're in like a family, to have like this really cool uh, like situation, you know. Um, and if if we can't make it work for ourselves, we can't make other people like have that kind of uh, s situation as well. And we would like we really want to see more people, more companies working like we do. Um, so yeah. Other questions? Uh, yeah, back back here. Um, we don't use, like, officially, we don't use phones. Um, I mean, we all have mobile devices with data on them. Um, from, from time to time, people will do, like, Google Hangouts. Uh, I've done a couple pairing sessions where, you know, uh, I was working on some code and I needed help and I didn't, I didn't know exactly how things worked, so I uh, arranged the time to work on a specific piece of code with, like, somebody looking over my shoulder. Um, where we both had access to the keyboard and mouse and, you know, did stuff like that. But that's very rare. Um, and when I say it's like the, the most popular synchronous communication, it's, it's really like that's the office for us. Like chat rooms are our office. We have the danger room. You go there to like goof off, uh, like put animated GIFs and just hang out and see what people are up to. There's like topic-centric rooms for each product. 
Uh, there are rooms for things like meditation and things like, like there's all kinds of different stuff. So people just hang out in there and kind of, you know, chat with each other. Um, but generally, if you try and like arrange a phone call with a GitHubber, they'll probably say, "Hey, is there any way we can handle this on an email or whatever?" Like, even there's a, there's a subset of people who deal with the outside world. I'm one of them. Like, I give talks, I go to schools, I meet with administrators, teachers, things like that. So I have some you know some scheduling to do. Also, the training team is like that, and the community team. But beyond those groups that like interact with the outside world, like most everybody is spending their time you know working asynchronously or like in chat if they happen to be on chat at the same time they'll they'll sync up somebody over here had a question So I, I definitely have seen that problem as well. Um, in previous jobs, I've had that situation. So um, one of the things that's really important about having no hours and having no set quotas is also having no deadlines. Um, we don't talk about features before we ship them. We don't talk about what we're going to build next. And it's not because you know we don't think that they're awesome. It's just that we want to set expectations and we don't want to put you know the employees that are working on those things under stress. Uh, to deliver by a certain date, and we don't want to disappoint anybody. You know, it's better to underpromise and overdeliver. So, um, you know, by by not having deadlines, by just saying, okay, work on the things that you think are important. You know, commit yourselves to your projects. Make sure you finish them. You know, use good judgment, in making sure that you work on them enough. But uh, there's no deadline, so there's nobody rushing you to get it done in time, right? Um, so I think that's one one big way. The other thing is uh, is vacation and like taking time off. Um, so I talked about team and how we have this like internal system where you can like post your status and whatever. Anytime somebody like ships something, they'll post on team and say, "Hey, I just shipped X. Like, go check it out. Give me your feedback." Um, but also, people will post like, "I'm going on vacation next week," and they don't have to ask to go on vacation. They just put it on the calendar and say they're going to be out of office. And you know, those are like the most uh, they get the most response, like positive responses out of like any of the status. It's like, yeah, you deserve vacation. Go, like, take a long time off. And like, people take a couple vacations a year. You know, there, we have no set like length of time, like number of days per year that you can go. Um, and different people use it in different ways. But uh, I think that the the deadlines and the kind of culture of reinforcing people taking time off is are the ways that we like kind of work against that. In the back. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Team is not open source, uh, unfortunately. Um, maybe someday. Uh, so no, chat is um, is uh, campfire, thirty seven signals campfire. So you can use chat, and uh, most of our chat functionality comes from this thing called Hubot, which is open source. So all the like, all the cool stuff like I get notifications and stuff. Uh, Hubot pays attention to the room, and then. You know, fires a webhook that then notifies me. So you could set up your own notifications via you know some other service, uh, since you don't have Team. But um, yeah, most of that stuff is in in Hubot. Other questions? Yeah, this is a, a hot topic um, within, you know, within GitHub right now with with people talking about it. Um, it's it's like generally under the under the um, umbrella of feedback. You know, am I doing well? I don't have a manager to tell me if I'm doing well. Like, what's this? So this is like one of the things that are that's hard about working this way. Like, we don't have a good solution for that yet. Um, mainly, how you know I and other you know other people that I've worked with more closely have been combating that uh, is just by you know having from time to time, uh, just sending an email to somebody saying, "Hey, here's what I've been up to. You know, what do you think? Can you give me some feedback?" I've also seen people within the company creating like uh, Google spreadsheets and saying, "Like, here's some information like about how I want to be reviewed," and giving it to people and saying, "Hey, please review me. 
And if you want to, you can be anonymous. Like it do, this, you can or you cannot be anonymous, however you like. Um, and it's like a self-reflection uh, type of, you know, how am I doing type thing. Uh, and that is in no way related to compensation. Uh, there's no, actually right now, there's no process of uh, being, you know, formally reviewed and getting, you know, higher compensation. Um, at the time when you get hired, you negotiate like a normal hiring process. And um, I haven't had any experience with anything else yet. So um, from what I understand, if uh, there was actually there was a, a topic in one of the um, in one of the internal talks that was like, um, you know, if you if you don't feel secure, like in this hierarchy of things I was talking about before, if you're not secure and you need more money, ask for it. And then, you know, that's that's how that works. But there's not a like review process where you get a score or anything like that. Uh, and I know a lot of companies, uh, especially like large and successful tech companies, have things like that. I know Google has a pretty rigorous like feedback process that has been, you know, on one hand it sounds it sounds pretty good. On the other hand, like I've heard like kind of horror stories about it being like a totally political, gamed system. So um, yeah, we don't have anything comparable right now. So I think that's the the way we deal with that. Like that's a that's a hiring thing. Like we have to be very careful in the hiring process. It's so uh, so difficult to you know kind of deal with that. Basically, if somebody can't figure out what they need to be working on on their own and start doing it on their own without somebody telling them what to do, they're not going to do well at GitHub. Um, and that's happened a few times, um, and it was pretty obvious to everybody. And then they were you know let go. But other than that, there's there's not really a uh, you know, uh, a way to, you know, it, it's it's pretty obvious if someone's not doing anything, right? Like if you're th if you're coming from the like the idea of like having like a leecher, somebody comes in, gets hired, and then just does nothing. Like that doesn't happen. Like in all honesty, like that's, I think like it, it hasn't happened. But um, you can see most of the stuff we have like GitHub.com. If you look at for coding, it's very obvious. But if you look at like someone's profile, you have like the contributions graph. You can see what they're doing, and it's. It's like kind of a, you also have like a kind of internal promotion that you do. Um, so for me, like I said, you go to team and when you finish something, like after today, I'll, I'll go and I'll post like, I just gave a tech talk at, you know, TU Berlin. Uh, it was really fun, like whatever. And people will see that I'm doing that. Uh, so that's kind of like one of the ways that we keep a, you know, idea that people are doing things. So, um, yeah, so for the first part, uh, for compensation, I don't really know. Like, I, that's not been a, a topic that I've uh, gotten into. Uh, and then for the, um, the, like, who owns the company thing, um, as far as I know, and, and which is, like, public knowledge, um, is that GitHub was bootstrapped for a really long time, and it was owned entirely by the founders. You know, they owned everything. Uh, as people got hired, they, they gave out grants, you know, of stock options to be partial owners of the company as like a, as a benefit. And then, uh, like last year, they raised $100 million from Andreessen Horowitz uh, in venture capital series A. Um, and Andreessen Horowitz now has some portion of the company that they got for their investment. Um, and then, yeah, that's, I think it's pretty standard, actually, uh, pretty standard structure of how most uh, startups work. I think GitHub waited a long time before they took any outside investment. So that's like probably a good thing in our case, but um, yeah, I mean the the founders are still like own a bunch of the company and employees still own part of the company, and then now we have investors. Yeah. So uh, maybe we'll take one or two more. Yeah. Say again. I couldn't hear you. Ah. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. So the, the question was, is it an issue that the least popular tasks don't get done? Uh, yeah, that's an issue. Um, we just don't do those things. Um, like, if, if they're not popular, they don't get done. It's, there's like two, two qualifying statements. It's one is, if we don't use it, we don't build it, right? Like, uh, for example, you know, GitHub.com, we use GitHub.com all the time to use GitHub. So we're like the best 
possible testers. Like we, we build a feature, we're like, oh, this feature's awesome, and then we know it's gonna be awesome because we use it all the time. Uh, and if we don't use it, then we just like get rid of it. Um, and in the case of like things that need to be done that don't get done, uh, we generally hire for those positions, somebody who wants to do that type of thing, or we automate. So um, in the case of like shit work, like stuff that's like, you know, click this button 20,000 times. And I, I had some of that when I started. Um, so we give out these free GitHub accounts for students. And how do we know if someone's a student or not? Well, they fill out this form, and they type their email address, and they type their school name, and they verify their account. And then it goes into this queue, and somebody goes, approve, deny, approve, deny. And since I've started, there's like tens of thousands of students have signed up, and that's a lot of buttons to click. So what I did is I wrote an app that First, uh, it uses a database of schools that I've like kind of crafted from the internet, um, and like checks a whitelist and says, "Are they from this whitelist?" Then automatically approve them. So that was like one big win, but still there was a ton of stuff that wasn't on the on the whitelist. So then I uh, wrote a, another part of the application that goes to Mechanical Turk, and posts the name of the school, the part of the email address that's like at something dot edu or com or whatever. Post that part and uh, like some other non personally identifiable internet information. And then I have the Mechanical Turk people do, uh, you know, is this a school? Research what country the school's in, how many students go to that school, whatever, and then it all comes back. So that was a lot more fun problem than clicking the button 30,000 times. So make it into an automation problem, and then it will get solved, and then no one will have to do it ever again. Um, but you know, there are tasks that just don't get done, and we either hire or automate uh, in those situations. So yeah, one more. You've had a couple, so I'll go back here. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, we've had, like, I started at around 100 people, so I'm not an expert in this, but um, when the company was much smaller, you know, 5, 10, 15 people, uh, they had the same kind of structure, and it wasn't as, you know, as proven at that point. And people would say, will it scale, will it scale? It won't scale beyond 25 people, it won't scale beyond 50 people, it won't scale beyond 100 people. Now we're almost 200, and it's still working. Um, that's not without some, you know, some growing pains. Um, I think it will continue to work. I think what will happen, though, is that um, you know different parts of the company will kind of do their own uh, their own thing. Which is like with the hiring situation, we recently um, kind of started to do like, okay, now we have like a little bit more formal process of this is the person who makes the decision, and they're the one who says, you know, these are the five or six people I want involved in the interview process, and we'll collectively make that decision. But there's one person who is like kind of the point person, and that's always kind of been the case, and it's just getting more and more clear these days on where that's needed. So we've, we call it like the perp, the, pers the, the primarily responsible person, um, and it's not a commanded position. It's not like, hey, you're this, or anything like that. It's just like people start doing it. So the person who said, oh, let's go to Berlin and have this thing became the perp for that destination and was responsible for finding the house and doing all this stuff, and then eventually getting it paid for, and et cetera. So uh, I think that's how it will kind of grow. I hope it keeps working because I like it a lot. Um, yeah. So uh, I think that's, that's probably uh, enough for questions. But I'll hang out. And if you guys want to talk more, uh, I will. But I'd like to let the people who, who want to go uh, head out. So thanks very much.